You're listening to Change Your POV Podcast, episode 144. You know, I learned that karma definitely does exist and I do something negative. I send out negative karma and it comes back to me tenfold. I send out positive karma and it comes back to me tenfold. And if I start improving myself, that counts as positive karma. And that's what led me to learn deeper into construction. Change Your POV is dedicated to help those who served in the military make positive transitions in their lives. Sometimes we get out of the service on our own terms. Sometimes we find ourselves separating before we expected to. This makes for an exceptionally difficult period in our life, without a doubt. At the end of the day, you have to get up, dust yourself off, and carve your niche back into the workforce, back into society, and back into some purpose and something that matters. Our next guest is finding his own path and helping those that he finds along the way. After all, that's what we do. Let's take a listen. Hello, folks, and welcome to Change Your POV Podcast. I am your host, Eddie Lazary, and today we have a special guest, Steve Palacios. How you doing, sir? Good. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. So Steve reached out to me. We were both dabbling around on Pat Flynn's Smart Passive income uh, Facebook group and he uh, and I posted something I don't even remember now what it was but he uh, reached out to me and said hey I, I'm, I'm digging what you're doing uh, I got some some stuff going on I'd like to to maybe see if we can add some value to your listening audience and I said sure he sent me his bio and I read it through and and uh, I definitely think we've got a lot to cover and we've got very little time to do so so let's just get right into it but before we do I would like to uh, talk about this week's sponsor, which is brought to you by none other than Change Your POV Book Club. And you're like, what? What's that? So sure enough, folks, starting in January, which is we're recording this now a week before the new year. So this episode is going to be going live probably the second week of January-ish. So if you're listening to this right now, it is going on. It is happening right now. The Change Your POV Book Club. So check it out. Here's here's how it works, and here's what we're doing it, and why we're doing it. So uh, Bennett Tanton, my co-host, and I, we are always reading books and or listening to audiobooks, and we're always talking about them offline. Things that we're learning, things that we're implementing into our own lives. He'll send me a book recommendation. I'll listen to it or read it, and I'll do the same for him. And then we always have people constantly asking us what we are reading and if it's any good. And so we're always referring books that we've either read or listened to to other people. So I said, hey, Bennett, wouldn't it be kind of cool if we extend our offline conversation to our listening audience in the form of a book club? And I know the word book club just sounds a little, I don't know, a little 80-ish and a little off, outdated, I guess, so to speak. So let me explain to you what our version of a book club is. So every month we pick a book, and we've got the first four months already chosen, and to learn more, you can actually head over to changeyourpov.com forward slash book club. And right there, it'll kind of explain to you what it is we're doing a little bit more than I'm doing right now. But we're going to have a book. And January's book is called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. And I'm, I've downloaded that on Audible, and he's done the same thing. And we're starting to listen to it. And so if you want to be part of the conversation, we've got a, a secret Facebook group that is uh, – I've already created it. And uh, you can head on over to that uh, that website that I just gave you. You can uh, sign up, and I will send you, I will add you to the Facebook group. And what's going to happen inside this Facebook group is we're going to have conversations about the book. Each each month, each new book, we're going to talk about what it is that we're reading and or listening to, uh, things that we like about it, things that we can use to implement into our lives. And then we're going to have some special podcast episodes around the book and and we're going to do our very best to try to get as many authors of these books on the show for an interview as well. However, the interviews with the authors and the uh, special podcast episodes talking about the book are only going to be made available to those members in the book club. So don't miss out on any of this great content. You're going to want to be a part of it. And the best news of all, folks, it's all free. All right. It's all free to you. Um, just head on over. 
sign up and I will send you an email with more details and let's get this party started. The subtle art of not giving a fuck starting January. I've already started listening to it, like I said, and it is an excellent book. Um, I believe it's a New York Times bestseller and uh, just an incredible, incredible author and incredible book. So uh, check it out. Come be a part of it. Sign up today. All right, Steve, let's talk about this. I want to get into your background, your military experience and your background. And you've got a unique story. I've had many, many veterans and uh, prior service members come on the show and and share with me a lot of their stories. But this is the first story of your kind and it's different, and I really wanted to kind of talk about it. And first, I got to say kudos to you, man, for being you know fully transparent with this because you know even though it's long in our past, every one of us, anyone listening to this today, has done things in their past or have made decisions in their past that they just kind of look back on and shake their head and say, "Oh, what what the hell was I thinking?" Right? And and you're and you're no different. Uh, but you've agreed to come on the show and actually share your story, which I think is incredible. So thank you very much, Steve, for reaching out and uh, agreeing to come on the show and sharing your story. So first, where are you from and uh, what are you all about right now? Uh, my home of records is uh, Southern California. I'm a, I'm a Golden State boy, uh, born and raised here except for a few travels out, including uh, my military time. But um basically where where my path has ended up is uh oh about fifth, uh, 13 years ago just over 13 years ago met my wife and uh had a fun run of it and then found out we were pregnant turned out it was uh twin girls identical twin girls oh, wow. and uh about that time i you know shortly after they uh they were born i realized wow i have two colleges educations that i'm going to have to come up with at the same time so i need to make something on myself and i went and got into uh university of phoenix online and uh, uh i got an associate in art of uh network engineering networking and then uh, went straight into a bachelor science program for software engineering and uh about 2009 i ventured out on my own and started freelancing and I've been doing that, uh, as my primary focus for a while, uh, for most of that time. And, uh, recently I went into, um, started moving into education. I always wanted to go back and get my master's and, and, uh, then maybe think about a doctorate, but, uh, get a master's and then teach at a university level software, because it's been something that I've been interested in since I was like 10 or something. And, uh, just go from there and uh, wrote a few uh, programs, uh, Android apps, uh, web apps, and uh, Cake PHP. And most of it's been uh, internally used, not public. But uh, yeah, that's where I've uh, been. And now, you know, after so long of having to figure figure out how to manage projects on my own as a solopreneur, as it's called, a one-man show, uh, had to kind of pick and choose my way through project management styles. And now I'm shifting my focus into teaching that. That's awesome. We're going to get into that in a little bit. I, I myself have a background in project management, something that I, I find extremely you know, interesting. And I actually started my college education in the finance world. I was, a uh, I signed up to be a, um, it was a, a bachelor's degree in, uh, business administration with a concentration in in uh, accounting, and I got through accounting too, and realized there's no way in hell I want to make a go of accounting for a career. So I quickly changed my degree program and 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 just got an undergraduate uh, undergraduate degree in business administration, and then moved on to my MBA with a with a focus in project management. So I dig project management; I like it a lot. Um, and I, I you know p I, it, I don't know. I, I kind of toss it back and forth in terms of um, I would love to get my PMP, uh, Project Management Professional uh, Certification. And I, I know it would be a lot of work going into it, but my the, the reason I think for me that I haven't really pursued it yet is because of the PDUs that you've got to maintain afterwards. And that's a lot of additional work uh, that you have to maintain that certificate. It's not a one and done. you got to you know study, get it, and then you got to continue every year 
have uh, a certain number of what they're called what they call PDUs. Yeah, they're like credits, so you can get them from going to seminars, taking additional you know, education, even giving classes at local universities worth something. So there's a lot of work to to keep that that uh, that certification. So that's where I've kind of where I've left. I've got a lot of real world project management experience, and I just dig it. I think it's really fast. It's a fascinating industry, to, to tell you the truth, and it can be applied in in so many different ways. I mean, you you find project management in every industry, in every company. They may not call it project management. And they may not even realize that's what it is. Um, and they may not even have the title of project manager, but there's a lot of people out there, a lot of service members and, and veterans out there that are doing the work of project management and may not even realize it. But before we get down that that road of project management, I do want to go backwards a little bit and talk about your military career. So you you started out in high school in the the youth program, the Civil Affair Patrol, which is the Air Force equivalent of like the Army's ROTC program. Is that correct? Yeah, I started out freshman, but um, it's similar to like the the Young Marines, the Sea Cadets, you know, all, all those. But actually, you follow the chain of command down and or back up from the kids that are out there doing the stuff you follow it all the way back up and you end up at the commander in chief uh, through the air force uh, academy mm. uh, through the commandant there um and so it's uh, an official auxiliary that was charted uh, believe it or not december 1st 1941 mm. that uh, was originally chartered to give civilians uh, the authority and means to assist with uh, coastal patrols mainly. But um, the, that was their primary mission that grew into uh, the DEA on uh, board runs. And it's a civilian force that uh, gets its marching orders from the commander-in-chief by way of the commandant there. Leading into kind of what lessons were you able to gain from that experience of your early time in the Air Force and being separated into the the man that you are today and how you've been able to leverage those lessons into, you know, your family, your business uh, or anything else you've, you, you, you've got going on? What I boiled my experiences down to a few years ago kind of congealed in my head that you know pain is temporary pride is forever is what I used to say and that kind of has served me well but what I learned was that if I don't have a a roadmap a vision of where I'm going then I don't know how to get there and after a number of years of just kind of wandering through life aimlessly, wherever the wind blows kind of thing, I realized that I, I need to either polish my glass belly button or pull my head out and figure out what the hell I'm going to do with my life. And, you know, that's about the time that I also met my then girlfriend, now wife, and kind of just really started clearing my head and figuring out what I was going to do. And then Probably at that point, you know, 23, 24 is when I started really, truly emotionally growing up Mm -hmm. because, you know, after a considerable amount of self-introspective and and reflection that who I was when I went into the Air Force and when I got out of the Air Force in those intervening years, really – I was still just a high school kid that was, you know, a high school punk, I should say, that I didn't know who I was. And, you know, getting in a stable relationship and looking back and realizing, you know, that's not a good place to be. You know, I almost, I guess you could say it's like being a drug addict. You know, you're just addicted to being a jerk and it never serves you well. And, Looking back at the lessons from my time in boot camp, uh, at track, and correctional confinement, and my travels around the country, it's just kind of, well, what am I going to do with my life? And I started picking out specific instances and you know, our experiences, and it's like, okay, I need to figure out who I am, 
what I want to be mm-hmm. and who I want to be. And, you know, I learned that karma definitely does exist and I do something negative. I send out negative karma and it comes back to me tenfold. I send out positive karma. It comes back to me tenfold. And if I start improving myself, that counts as positive karma. And that's what led me to learn deeper into construction, deeper into aerospace maintenance, you know, aviation maintenance, and uh, ultimately ultimately led me to going through school to learn networking and software engineering. And, you know, that led me to uh, getting laid off from a grunt job that I had in 2008, at the end of 2008. And it's like, well, I'm in school for this. Let's start using it. And so I started uh, working as a freelancer. And honestly, I hate that term. Recently, I've come to hate that term because a freelancer is just a hired pair of hands. Uh, as a freelancer, I, I've i come to realize that I'm no different than the day laborer that's just pushing a broom around. I've invested all this time in my past to better myself and to really learn from my mistakes, but I'm still just being paid for a set of hands, basically, uh, you know, granted programming computers and smartphones, but still just a pair of hands. And so I started really trying to hone my craft and figure out how I can work better. And this is one of the biggest lessons that I've learned from, you know, my parents and largely from the military, from the air force is always be looking at how you can do something better. Mm -hmm. Every time you do it, figure out how you can do it better and then move forward with that. And so here I am trying to figure out how to do things better. And in school, they never taught me about project management really it was just a summary but the assumption was at the time is when you're working on software projects you're going to be working with a project manager somebody like yourself who's more specifically trained in it and um that was about the time that agile started really picking up uh, the agile project management philosophy Mm -hmm. is more of what it is and um you know, it, it, but it, everything out there really, as far as project management over the years, as I'm working these different projects, totally on my own, there's me on one side and the client that hired me on the other, really, it, there there is no team on my side and project management philosophy revolves around multiple people working in a project on multiple roles. And I was wearing all the hats. And so I had to kind of pick and choose my way through what was out there to come up with uh, something really effective to running the, you know, my, my projects so that my clients don't get all pissed off at me. Uh, I mean, so, so what was that that you came up with? It's, I, I really haven't come up with a name for it, but it's, um, kind of a mix between scrum and Kanban and, you know, a few other areas cherry picked from, uh, the waterfall cycle, you know, the the SDLC pretty much follows at its heart, the old style, uh, different aspects of agile, but it's kind of a real mix and it's become something complicated but elegantly simple at the same time that allows me to stay on top of the projects that I have now. So when you say you created, is this something, is this like a piece of software that you've developed or is it just a, a process that you've come up with? Like what's the the mechanics around it? It's more of a process. Uh, I found it what I've had to come up with is something that's very flexible. You know, I, uh, last year I, because I wanted to get into education, I took a part-time job running a computer lab for a local elementary school. And so, you know, there's three and a half, four hours of my day gone five days a week. And, you know, of course I don't want to disappear from my family. You know, I love my wife. I love my kids. I like paying attention to them and spending time because they are quite the crack up. But at the same time, I have this work that I need to do. So 
I needed something that was flexible that could handle, you know, when my son comes up to me and says, Hey daddy, check out this cool thing that I did with my Nerf guns and that tape you gave me, I can stop where I'm at, go and spend a half hour, hour with him and then come back and do, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, a Pomodoro. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's something that I've done for, you know, for those of you that don't know, a Pomodoro is, um, you're probably going to be able to explain it better than me, but basically you work in chunks of time. Uh, like for example, for me, I work in 45 minute chunks of time with a 10, 15 minute break. And that's when I get my coffee because I turn coffee into code. And that's when I go to the bathroom and I go and hang out and uh, decide, well, I think I'm done working for the next few hours. I'm going to go and have a tea party with my daughters or paint their nails or let them paint my nails or go draw with them. Or, you know, I, I get to experience everything and still work because I've found a way to make this a little more flexible. And one of the keys is the Pomodoros where I work in 30, 45 minute blocks, depending on what I'm doing. Um, kind of a time chunking. Uh, I use, uh, 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 like a, an extension for Chrome browser that helps me manage that. And also an app called toggle T O G G L mm-hmm. oddly enough. Um, and that, that, that's how I keep my time in, in check as far as what I'm actually doing now. I've um, been experimenting with time chunking where I take my Google calendar and I block out, okay, I've got this time here where I'm working at the school. And then after that, I'm going to give myself an hour to run a few errands. And then the next three hours, I'm sitting in front of my computer and I'm going to see if I can crank out three Pomodoros without getting interrupted. And I put in my headphones, I've got my focus music going and that, that works great. And, uh, another thing that Forgive me if I'm going too fast. This, this is where I really get excited. About yeah, man, this. go for it. <laughs> um, what uh, I recently, well, not recently, I guess about a year ago, I came across um, a blog of um, Paul Miners, and that gentleman has been such a huge resource for me. And excuse me, in my uh, through his blog, I found uh, an app called Asana. Mm-hmm. And using the free version of that, it's more than enough that allows me to organize and prioritize and keep track of what I need to focus on. And I've actually been able to expand that to where it's more than just what I do in in software in my consulting work. It's where... I, I'm using it successfully to keep track of, you know, other things that I want to do in my life, self-improvement, launch, uh, you know, consulting dev that the consulting developer brand that, you know, really it, it's like I, I've developed all this process and, and systems and tools and hooking it all together. And it's once it's set up, it's really elegantly simple and it's extremely flexible that allows me to task shift as fast as my brain will let me. And so that's where the consulting developer comes in where I'm collecting all my thoughts and I'm putting it all out there that, you know, Hey, anybody else wants to try this? It's there it goes. So is that a desktop software application or is it, is a, a, like, um, a smartphone app or what is it exactly? Originally, it was um, uh, a kind of a suite of software that would run on a server that was in their in their auction house and their their computers out on the auction floor where they would check bidders in and take bids and then check bidders out after the auction was over. And I got involved and then they decided, well, we want to make it so that people can bid online from home. So I built a web app that built that kind of bolted on top of that. Mm hmm looking back at my code now, it's kind of an ugly thing, but you know, that's just hindsight. Now what we're doing is taking that original application that I wrote for them and we're slowly transitioning it into where it's all just a web app, like, um, you know, like zoom or, uh, go to webinar or Asana or toggle, you know, it's just a total web app and that's where it's going to end up probably in the next year or so. 
but that that's where I'm at now and that's my only client that mm -hmm. uh, I'm working with right now what would you say to those listening to this right now that maybe like you had something in their background maybe a you know their military service didn't end up being you know what they wanted or thought it would be perhaps they end up getting out much sooner than they had anticipated or planned whether it be through you know a separation medical discharge a number of reasons why people get out of the military uh, un unexpectedly and in some and in some cases you know look back on that time as not only as a learning experience uh, for the good things that they've gone through, but a learning experience of the bad things that they've gone through and the stigma of carrying that forward into into your later years in life. Uh, what what words of, of guidance or, or uh, you know, anything that you could say to those that might be walking a, a mile or two in, in your shoes? What I would say is, learn from, from your mistakes. You know, it took me a number of years to realize that just, yeah, fucked up. Okay. Wow. Well, how did I get to that point to where I made that single bad decision or I made those string of bad decisions? What can I learn from that? And really you just sit down, think about it, grab a beer, grab a glass of water, some tea, whatever your fancy is, and just think about what, did I do wrong and how can I learn from that and move forward? Once I realized that my life isn't going to change until I accept that I screwed up, I need to learn what I did so I don't do it again and I need to move forward. And honestly, you know, after about five, six years, maybe not even that long, employers, I'd submit my, my resume and I'd write on there that I was in the Air Force, that I was discharged under honorable conditions, but you know, it wasn't a, an honorable, it was just general under honorable. And the reason was misconduct. I would write that my RE code to be, and I would have a copy of my packet when I would go in and and the first couple times, you know, I went for warehouse, I went for forklift, you know, things like that. And they would say, what, what's this about? And I'd tell them, I done fucked up. I screwed up and I made a few bad choices. And they'd be like, okay, once, only once in, you know, 20 some odd years have I been asked for the details in that packet that mm -hmm. they gave me when I discharged yeah, I think that's an important lesson for everyone listening to this out there to, to hear. And, and that is there's people, employers, um, whether it be large organizations or large employers or smaller organizations, smaller companies or even, you know, small startups or whatever. Uh, a lot of people, are they're, they're forgiving. They realize that they themselves at some point in their life have made a mistake has, have perhaps done things that they wish they wouldn't have done or made a decision or a string of decisions that they wish they could have maybe not have done. Um, and so a lot of people are very forgiving when it comes to that. Where people aren't very forgiving is when you try to cover it up or be less than truthful about it. And, and, and then eventually it will come out and then people are like, wow, you know, if you would have just been honest with me, I would have given you a shot or given you a chance. Um, or they'll, you know, maybe they did give you a, a shot and a chance and then found out later, sometime later after you've been employed for a while that a lot of that information was, uh, was misguided and not fully truthful. And so that's when, you, you lose the trust of those individuals. Not only are you losing their trust, but you, you've really kind of shown them a level of disrespect that, that makes it extremely hard for them to come back from. And so if you're not getting immediately terminated from that position, you're at the very least not being looked upon in, in the highest regard from that point forward, right? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, stolen valor is a thing that really gets under my skin. You know, I I don't go around and you know, I, uh, I, I made some mistakes in, in my history and yeah, you know, it's, I'm, I'm applying to get it on my license because California does that now. And, you know, if somebody asks, yes, I was in the air force and yes, I was active for nine months and I 
made some poor choices, but I've moved on, you know, but I've, I've run across people who are like, Oh yeah, you know, I've, I've done this and I may have been a little guilty, you know, first few years, maybe more afterwards where I kind of made it sound like that I was in longer or did more or different things in there. But, you know, to me, I've truly come to understand that oath that we take, you know, that responsibility that we you know, go and volunteer for. And to me, anybody who's worn a uniform, whether it's in the armed services or in public safety, that is a huge thing. And just be honest with yourself and everybody else that, hey, look, this is what it is, you know, and and this is what I've done. And I've found, you know, I've been scared of, in the past, you know, when I tell people oh, I was only in for nine months, I was only active for nine months, I was scared that I'd tell them that and they'd look differently on me, uh, down on me or pity me or something. But really, it was just, okay. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you, you learn from it. Let's, you know, that, that, that's cool. You know, mm-hmm. you, you got to be in. You got to have that experience. And that's the end of it. There, there was no change after that from what it was before. And once I you know, figured that out. It's like, Oh, Hey, you know, I don't need to hide the fact that I was in the military. I don't need to puff it up to sound more than it is. It, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that honesty, uh, I, it could be in my own head, but it seems like it's opened some opportunities for, for me, you know, in the past that just be honest and move forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as bad as it is, or maybe, or, or let's just, let's say it like this. As bad as it is in your own head, it's not as bad as it is in other people's own head, right? So, so it's way worse in in your brain and in your heart than it ever will be in anyone else's. And so, you kind of almost have to get to the point where you forgive yourself and allow yourself to put it down and move on. I think that's the hardest hardest thing when you're making decisions or when you've made a poor decision in your life and you're trying to get past it and you're trying to move on from it. Uh, sometimes we are our own worst enemies and we are the ones that are preventing our own selves from making that progression move forward. Right. Oh, ab- absolutely. I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. It's that once I have learned that, okay, I can forgive myself for this and until I do, I can't move forward with my life. Mm. You know, that that was a, a long road. Uh, from my perspective, it was a long, rough road where I was barefoot over the beach pebbles and it was painful. But once I realized, hey, look, I don't have to walk this path, then you, I I'm, I'm, was able to move on and go past it and it's like, hey, everybody's got to get to that point on their own. It, mm. It's something you have to want to do. But once you're ready and you put that down and you move on, it, 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 it it's like the sky's clear mm. and the sun comes out, the birds start singing, and things really start looking up once you decide, I don't have to punish myself. I made a mistake. I need to move on. That's right. And so this month is a month where we uh, talk about setting goals and objectives in our lives, in our business, and and with the project management background that you have, I'm sure you've got some creative ways to set goals and objectives. So for the listening audience out there, what are some key takeaways? What are some things that folks at home can do going into 2017 to help them navigate goals and objectives, things that they want to do and or accomplish into this new year? Um, Obviously, I'm going to say go to consultingdev.net and follow me. (laughs) Really, it it comes down to just deciding what do I want to accomplish? You don't have to wait for January 1st or December 31st to decide what I want to do in the next 12 months. And really – one thing I'm sure a lot of people have heard about the 12 week year really it, that is all about just break it up from 12 months down to 12 weeks. 
run three months at a time. It's a shorter run. You, it doesn't look like this giant hill that's in front of you. You know, when you're looking at it for a year, it's there's this giant hill in front of you. Oh, my God, that's a long ways I've got to go to get past this. No, it, it's just here we are. Instead of looking at what I need to do for the next 12 months, look at what you need to do for the next three months. Where do you want to be? You think about, I want to have a better paying job. I want to have a better you know, wardrobe. I need new shoes, so I need a better job. I want to be able to take my kids to Disneyland or to whatever Six Flags or whatever. You have that goal. It could be something as simple as, I want to plant a garden. Spring's coming up. Mm-hmm. You look at that goal and you say, can I do this in three months? Can I do this in the next 12 weeks? Yes. All right. I pick a goal that's achievable in 12 weeks and I break it down into 12 steps. And there I have a goal for each week. And now instead of looking at a giant hill that's in front of me, I'm looking, you know, instead of a mountain, I'm looking at a hill Mm -hmm. and I have a clear objective each week. And then Every Sunday, you just sit down and you look at what you want to do for the next week and you break that up into three or five or seven smaller tasks that are simple that can be done in a short amount of time. You know, like, for example, the the garden. I want to plant a garden. So what do I need to do? I know I want to start that in April. So by March, I need to have a plot set up. What do I need to do? Well, in, you know, I need to make sure I've got the area cleared of weeds. I've got the planting materials, the soil, my seeds or seedlings or whatever I'm going to start with. And I break that down. Okay, so I'm going to start with preparing the bed. In January, I'm going to decide how big it is and how big it's going to be and clear the ground. There you go. There's a few goals that you can do in January. Week one, you figure out what you want to grow and how, how, uh, how much you want to grow. And you can use that to figure out how big it is. Week two, you start clearing. And week three, you order it off. And really, this giant goal of I want to plant a garden by April break it down and there you go for anything in your life, whether it's, I want to learn how to program. I want to learn how to fix a car or change a tire or fly a plane or become an astronaut, whatever it is, it can always be broken down into smaller steps. Yeah. And so I think it's really important for us to kind of help from a project management standpoint. This is in essence, what project management is, and it be, and it's kind of second nature to those of us that are trained in project management. But for for folks listening, the the number one thing that I get when I ask people what their goals are not 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 what their goals are, but why didn't they accomplish their goals? Um, a, a lot of the initial response I get from people is, "Well, I didn't know where to start." Right. Um, how come you're not on the path to achieving that goal or achieving that objective? And a lot of people say, I just don't know where to start. And from a project management standpoint, it's what we call backwards planning. You start with, you, you come up with your goal, your end state. What is What do you want to have accomplished by the end of that three-month period? That's your objective. That's your end goal. And then when you're what you're trying to do is don't even worry about where to start. That's going to come that's going to come at the end of this process. You got to figure out where you want to be in three months, and then you, like you're saying, Steve, you're going to go backwards in time and say, okay, in order to have this completed goal of starting a garden, what do I need to to do before that? Right? What I need to do before that? What I need to do before that? And you're coming up with with actions that you need to take prior to that next step, and you're going to go all the way back until you get to until you run out of things that you have to do before that, right? And then that is basically your next or your starting point for that overall objective. And one tool that I find extremely powerful in order to help you work out something and do backwards planning is a tool called Workflowy. Have you ever heard of this? Actually, I was just taking notes in it. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, I think... 
And again, every tool out there that we can mention is going to work well for some people, not work well. It all depends on how your brain thinks and operates. But I find Workflow extremely powerful in that it's 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 simple enough. What I mean by that is sometimes you get into these applications that are so complex and overwhelming that the learning, I mean, it's a steep learning curve just to learn how to use the application. Workflow is simple enough where you don't really need to know a whole lot about how you know to to make it work. It's very intuitive in the way in the way it works, and you can basically start your goal and start plugging in additional you know bullets and add a, a work a, you know flush out a schedule in order to achieve a goal. So, if those of you that aren't or have never heard of Workflowy, and I know that Bennett and I have talked about it in a previous cast. As a matter of fact, it's one of my top 2016 tools that I mentioned in a previous podcast about our tools that we that we found useful in 2016. Um, you can check that out by heading over to changeyourpov.com forward slash workflowy, and that's W-O-R-K-F-L-O-W-Y. Again, changeyourpov.com forward slash workflowy. And, uh, yeah, you can check that out. It's free. You get, like, uh, you can add, like, 250 items per month for free. Um, and that, that, and that's, that's a quite a bit. I mean, when you first start out, at least when I first started out, I, I kind of consumed those 250 relatively, uh, quickly because I was just adding all kinds of things, learning, experimenting. Uh, I put a lot of podcasts. I'm actually using it now to, to flesh out my podcast interviews and schedules and things like that. So incredibly powerful tool. Uh, that's what I would recommend. And I really like your idea, Steve, of taking that 12 month, process and breaking it up into consumable three month chunks, but then not even looking at it in three months, but breaking those three months into 12 weeks and then taking those 12 weeks and breaking the number up into 12 steps. And then using that backwards planning methodology we just discussed, uh, then you can uh, work backwards in time and, and come up with what your first actions need to be. Very cool. I know it sounds extremely complicated, but when you break things up in their smallest components, it's really quite easy, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's like I need to build a bridge. Well, you start with the first stone. You don't look at I need to get across this ravine with a bridge. You start with the first stone mm. and figuring out how to get from A to B. It's it's the journey in life. And, you know, as I recently adopted and actually I put this on my landing pages, you know, uh, <clears throat> vision without action is a dream, a daydream. Mm-hmm. Action without vision is a nightmare. Right. And if you just go blindly, yeah, you're finally taking action, but you, it, it won't be something that you stick with. And you know, oh, here's an epiphany I just had. It's maybe that's why my New Year's resolutions have never stuck because I just go and do it. And oh man, you know, by by February, I'm like the. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. A few tips uh, for you on uh, Workflow sure. is that um, if you share Workflow and somebody else signs up, you both get some extra points to use. So instead of 250, you could end up with 500 or, or whatever, and um, that uh, you get more points or you pay. But I love figuring out how to do things on for little or no cost, uh, monetary wise at least. So you share Workflowy and somebody you shared with signs up using your link and you get extra points. And another thing that, uh, I don't know if you want to keep this in or not, but I've discovered this week, uh, I hit my max at the end of last week, my 250, mm-hmm. but I didn't realize it because I work so much from my mobile that, I am actually at 317 points or bullet points in workflow, even though I'm supposed to be capped at 250. Oh, no kidding. I go, yeah, uh, on the web, or it, it won't really let me add more points. I can go through and rearrange and change notes and all that. Sure. But on the mobile, I can keep adding bullet points in and keep moving with it. So if you do that, does it does it still reflect when you bring it up on your desktop? Yeah. Oh, it, it does. Wow. Yeah, I go I go to um, add a new bullet point, 
and it comes up with a pop up and it says you've uh, reached your maximum 250. And I look down at the bar on the bottom and it says I have 317 of 250 allowed. Huh. Interesting. But I go back to the mobile and I can keep on adding and I get absent minded like that. And so it's a good thing it let me do that and it's keeping it. Yeah, right. Yeah, hopefully it doesn't like wipe out or or erase anything you've put in there. I don't think it would, but <laughs> so yeah. so that's a good point though. So that that link that I just provided everybody that is actually my it's a is a redirect to my link, uh, and so anybody that clicks on that you can sign up, and you're not only going to sign up for yourself, but you're going to um, be giving me some love and giving me some some free monthly credits to use as well. So. Um, so we can kind of scratch each other's backs that way. So it works really well. Every, and every, everyone that I've shared this with has all come back to me and said, wow, like, how did I not know this? Ex-? Because there's a lot of apps out there that you just hear a lot about, you hear a lot about, you hear a lot about, and then you try it and you're like, eh, it's all right. But Workflow is one of those apps that I literally never, ever heard about, never got an ad for it. It just, it was like this hidden world and I stumbled across it somehow and I was like, oh, my God, like, where has this been my whole life? You know what I mean? Absolutely. That's my view. Exactly. It's like, ah, I heard Cliff Ravencraft talking about it and he did a little webcast and showed it. And I was like, oh, that looks like something. And since minute one, I've been in love with it. I tell my wife, watch out. This is going to replace you. <laughs> <laughs> replace you is my love of my life. That's right. Oh, man. So it was a great conversation and broke up a little bit at the beginning of the show. So, folks, I apologize for any uh, uh, breaking of the audio. It's been a little bit crazy this time of year. The bandwidth is everybody wants to go online and shop for Christmas gifts and whatever else that they're doing this time of year. But uh, I think I think everybody's online doing the after Christmas sale shopping. You know what I mean? Not only that, but they got all their new toys. That's all. That's right. So everybody's on there. Learn. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's got a new phone, new phone, iPad, I, you know, all of those things, right? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely crazy. All right, well, fo- uh, man, uh, great conversation. I really thank you for coming on, Steve, and sharing your story. You know, a lot of times you get people on the shows talking about how much success that they've had in their life, but we rarely ever reflect back on some of the failures that we've experienced along the way, and and how we've been able to leverage those failures and turn them into a positive in our lives. Because let's face it, everyone's made mistakes in their life. Everyone's had setbacks. Everyone's had failures. And everyone defines those differently. But to say you've gone through life, even as the most successful person in in the world, uh, Richard Branson, Oprah Winfrey, you know, Tony Robbins, you you take the pick of the person you really look up to as a as a very successful person. Trust me, folks, they've all they've all had setbacks, they've all had mistakes in their lives, things that they've done that they regret. But you know what? They just decided not to let it stop them. You know? Absolutely, that's the way to go. All right, uh, where can people find more about you? I know that you've got your um, your website there, consultingdiv.net. Uh, could you spell that for everyone so we can get that? And oh, by the way, folks, it will be in the show notes for this episode. So don't feel like you have to write it down, but I just want to kind of get it out there so everybody can start thinking about it now. Absolutely. It's uh, consultingdev.net, spelled C O N S U L T I N G D E V, all one word. And, um, for for your your friends there in your audience, I'm gonna put together a nice little resource guide that actually has Workflowy on it. It's something that I've been building, uh, putting together here for a couple of weeks in my spare time. But I'm gonna get that wrapped up and have this ready for your your audience when we go live here, and that'll be at consultingdev.net forward slash change your POV, all one word. Awesome, that's very cool. Thank you, Steve. That's that's awesome. All right, folks, you can find all of the show notes for this episode at changeyourpov.com forward slash episode 144. Never miss an episode. Hit subscribe on your favorite podcast player of choice. We have a lot more great content headed your way. Come be a part of our community over at Change Your POV Squad Facebook group. And folks, don't forget, sign up for our book club. Until next time. <laughs>